All right, well, it's noon. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Hanwald, Assistant Head of School here at One Schoolhouse, and I'm just going to kind of get us going. We've still got folks coming in from the waiting room, but I'll share my screen and we'll do a little bit of housekeeping and business before Rachel and I get started. So, Rachel, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, we yeah. are talking about sort of rethinking school-wide outcomes. And we've just had a conversation. I think we're going to really spark some interesting conversation when we think about outcomes. So do you mind just saying hello and introducing yourself? And then I'll get into some of the other things we're going to talk about today. Sure. I'm Rachel Herline. I'm the academic dean at Holton Arms School. We're in all-girls school outside of DC. Um, I've been in independent schools now for 17 years. I started my career um, in Baltimore County Public School. Then I found my way into a part-time English teaching job uh, at Garrison Forest School outside of Baltimore. And that was my first step into the independent school world. And um, I haven't left. Um, it's, it's been a wonderful journey. Great, thank you so much. And I just want to... Um, Remind everyone that on our blog, we've got a post today as well about mission aligned student outcomes and how they support your value proposition as an independent school. Next week's webinar, we're gonna talk about the walled gar garden and that it's not there anymore and maybe it was never real at all. So join us for that. If you found your way to this webinar via the Academic Leaders Listserv, great. If you found your way here via another way and you'd like to join the Listserv, please know all academic leaders are welcome. And um, if you're wondering if you're an academic leader, the answer is probably yes. If you're thinking about the big picture of education and, and how to help that student curriculum and pedagogy experience. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter on our blog. There's a little box. Um, we send out two newsletters a week, and we'd love to have you receive those. And if you are interested in outcome-based education and really rethinking those outcomes and how they might be more mission aligned, I'd invite you to join us for leadership for advanced independent curriculum. That course starts next week, and there are spaces available. We would love to have you. All right, so this is the time of the webinar where we always unveil the pulse. And so the question this week was, what resources do you use to describe student outcomes? And Rachel, when I showed you this, when we were getting ready, um, you said one thing, and then we both sort of reacted. So I'm gonna share it again, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we found. So number one sharing of outcomes is the college list. Where are our students admitted afterwards? And do you wanna tell a little bit about what you predicted and where it showed up? In terms of um, everyone going for the list of, you know, saying that that's one of the only measures that we, we all kind of have grabbed onto. Um, we yeah. did talk about, we weren't surprised that college admissions was gonna be there. Um, and then our conversation has been about academic competencies and that's, that's pretty far down the list. Well, hopefully our conversation today will help that move up the list. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I want to remind everybody that Sienna will be dropping in the chat some links if you haven't had a chance to participate in the Pulse and you want to move the needle, please do and do that. Um, we also will be happy to answer questions via the Q&A as we get going. So. Rachel, one of the reasons I was so eager to have you join us was because of the work you've been doing for the past few years in just rethinking how Holton Arms both designed curriculum and then communicated that work in the community. So let's go back to the beginning. What got you interested in taking a deep dive into how learning outcomes work? So I joined Holton Arms seven years ago and Academic Dean was a new position that they had just developed. So that kind of gave me a wide open, you know, um, opportunity there. And what was very helpful is they had just completed their self-study to get accreditation through Ames. And so I was kind of handed these marching orders um, to take a look at our programming. We are a third grade through 12th grade school and our self-study showed that we were not behaving as one school, that we really needed to take a look at how to bring ourselves together and align philosophically and in our practices 
um, in all three of our divisions, lower, middle, upper. Um, it also had this charge to figure out a way to take the institutional priorities, the community priorities, and help them to work in concert with each other rather than to be seen as this big list of things that we're constantly trying to work on, um, keeping the plates all spinning at once, um, but rather to, to bring them together in a way um, that is meaningful and help people to understand that in fact, um, they're complementary and they're um, interdependent. And so um, the current priorities when I, when I came that they had already really been working on in different ways though, and really setting things um, as separate were um, our global education program was very much up and running and a focus on global competence. Um, the self-study um, really wanted the school to take a look at their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and um, having a more diversified faculty and helping students to build competence in that area. And then this idea of well-being and balance and helping, you know, we're an all-girls school. Um, so to help girls care for themselves when they tend to maybe put themselves last on a list sometimes. So that idea of well-being and balance, and we also define that as social and emotional learning and skills. So it was our interest to take those three areas and really find a way to articulate them um, in a way that brought them together. But there is a lot on that list. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's some big topics. <laughs> they really are. So how did you think about how to pull folks together and make sure that this felt like a united effort, not like we've got all these different initiatives? Yeah, so one of the first things we did is ensure that our structure of how we come together to talk and work on things um, was a three through 12 structure that included everyone. So we, we pulled teachers together um, in departments from all three divisions rather than meeting separately. Um, and we then, um, after kind of having everybody live that for a while, this idea of becoming three through 12, we asked for a group to come together. Um, it was a volunteer basis, um, but we made sure that this group had representation from all disciplines and departments um, and divisions. And we said, okay, here are these different priorities that, that we say we have. Let's take a look at what are the learning outcomes attached to these areas. Um, so we had recently, the year before, developed a curriculum review process. Um, we call it PRISM. It's an acronym, of course. Independent schools Excellent. love acronyms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, PRISM stands for pinpoint, research, illustrate, strategize, and move. And so that question you asked me about how do we take all these different priorities and get them together, that was our pinpoint question. Um, and so and to answer that question, we went to the research and that is where we decided not to reinvent the wheel. Um, we decided to look for what are those learning outcomes that have been developed in terms of global competence, in terms of DEI, in terms of um, SEL skills, and even digital well being skills. So we looked at organizations like the Asia Society, CASEL, the Center for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, um, Teaching Tolerance, which is now Learning for Justice. They have a great set of standards. Um, we took some ISTE standards that related to um, digital well-being and critical thinking, et cetera, problem solving, um, the partnership for 21st century skills. So we went to these places that have outcomes that related to our priorities as a community. And we did something we call Holtonizing. It's this new verb we've <laughs> Oh, that's great. So you've got acronyms and new verbs. That's yes, awesome. yes, yes, yes. So we holtonized these, um, these learning outcomes. And honestly, we saw just tremendous overlap between all of these different outcomes. And it really solidified for us this idea that you can't do DEIB work well if you don't have social and emotional learning skills in place, right? You right. can't have global competence if you don't have um, 
the competencies that you develop through doing DEIB work. So um, it was just very affirming for us. And what landed was a set of eight goals that we have for our students. And, and that language came from our work with Jay McTie. We did some backwards design work with Jay McTie um, and he calls them long-term transfer goals. And we, we dropped the long-term transfer piece. We called them goals. And then we articulated competencies that support each of those goals. Wow, so we are big fans of backwards design here at One Schoolhouse as well. Um, so what were some challenges as you, so you've got your, your big goals, and then what are some challenges helping that translate into the lived classroom experience? Yeah, so um, I think most independent schools have articulated some sort of outcome. Maybe it's through their pictures of a graduate. Um, and I think we really were asking ourselves, how do we make sure these, this is not beautiful, well-crafted language on a poster or on the website, right? How do we get that into the daily learning experience of our students? So the next step for us was to um, think about how we document curriculum and create a mapping template that honors backwards design that starts from a place of competency. Um, so something I, I didn't mention is that after we did the school-wide goals and competencies, departments wanted to go through that same process with their, their own mm -hmm. content. Um, and so they also have a set of three to five goals with related content area competencies. And so our template, our, our course planning template, which all teachers who teach that course work from one template. We don't have the three English 10 teachers having three separate templates for English 10. We all agree on the same one. Um, and it starts from a place of literally copying and pasting into the very first box. What are the competencies you plan to assess in this unit? And then we build the learning from there. I bet you had some interesting conversations along the way. That's one of the things that we end up talking about actually in some of our intro to independent schools um, that independent, it doesn't uh, equate necessarily to completely unaligned. So did you have to have some conversations around that? Absolutely. And I think um, where we agreed that we don't need to even write down what we do is in that daily plan or even weekly plan, right? We don't get that granular at all. What we agree on is the competence and how we will assess it. And from there, it's really up to the teacher how to get their, her students to that point. Um, I honestly, I feel that regardless of how we ended up deciding to map things, it, you can pick it any number of ways, but it's in the conversation that you really make progress with curriculum. Um, and I know like for us, I teach a section of 10th grade English and we have the great Gatsby, right? We've been teaching it for decades and no one's gonna, at, as of yet, <laughs> stop teaching <laughs> the great Gatsby in 10th grade at Holton Arm School. But what we were able to do is say, how do we leverage this book we've taught every year in service of the competencies. And we were able to pull competencies out about socioeconomic inequality. Um, our essential questions could get at our competencies while still having that same content. So it's kind of, um, you know, using content in service of, and that's how it really shifted our conversation, mm -hmm. which is I just said that in a way more <laughs> easy, succinct way than the actual experience of getting there. Right, and I think when you and I talked about this before, you talked about that opportunity. And I love the way that you say that, the competency within the course in service to the larger school-wide competencies. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you mentioned that Gatsby gave you an opportunity to think about uh, economic disparity and what that means. Right. Right. And so we've seen now as the maps are starting to come to life and people filling them out, we have the physics teachers taking a project they've done for years, but asking students to apply it to an issue of social justice. Um, and one of the ways, you know, we're making this work visible is besides 
our website that has all of our goals and competencies for school and for each individual um, content area is we had teachers write monthly columns about ways that the competencies are alive in their classroom. Um, to be, you know, to be open and transparent that we have put our content in service of the competence. I think that really speaks to the work that you're doing to make sure it's mission aligned. Right. And I, I think that's where we feel so excited now. I mean, this has been a five-year process, right? Okay. Um, that I just explained in five minutes. In 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll tell um, you everything you can do in five minutes. Right, right. But it, it really does um, make concrete for the members of a community how the mission is being lived. We don't just speak about ideas in the air. I can actually point to a curriculum map and say, here is where we talk about um, power and privilege and the historical underpinnings of um, how people get that and who has, um, for a Great Gatsby, for instance, instead of saying the unit is the Great Gatsby, which is what our Atlas mapping used to call it, right? When we used Atlas, like this unit is the Great Gatsby, the unit is the American dream. And we talk about who has access to that American dream and who doesn't and why. Um, so it, it's been very exciting to see the mission come alive in a really concrete way. That's exciting. We have a couple of questions that I'm going to work in here. Um, I've got some more things too. So we'll Okay. There, but there is a question about teachers. Were there, was there universal yes from everybody? Did, was, how did that go? I think at the time um, we said, okay, this is it. We need to stop editing. Here's the final goals and competencies. We counted um, 67 teachers had been in on the development of that. So that was over half of our faculty. And that happened because we shopped things around to different leadership groups and asked for their input. And um, after that initial team got a start on a draft. Um, and then of course, in their departments, they wrote their own goals and competencies. And I think, I feel that it happened in an organic way that really allowed for process. It wasn't a top-down um, directive. It was, let's start having these conversations about what would it look like if our portrait of a graduate was coming to fruition. So, um, and I have to say too, Holton really values professional learning. And we have spent hours and hours together learning three through 12. Um, and so this is, it's not just the curriculum work, it's alongside a whole lot of training and learning. And um, our director of diversity, well-being and global ed, Melissa Brown partners with me um, to make sure that that is a key component. And our curricular review process has learning built in, right? There's no such thing as, let me think about what I do and see what I feel like doing different. It's what are your questions and how are you gonna research those to land on what you should be doing or want to be doing? A really interesting professional learning process. So we've got um, three folks who have asked what tool you're using for curriculum mapping. So we've got to answer that question. <laughs> okay, so we are using our own tool. So we um, use Google, docs to create, we have a template that they get from the temp template gallery. Um, and then after they create the template for that course, Mary Dobroth, who is a consultant who works with us on all things curriculum has put together a um, Google Sheets where the courses are linked and it's also where we are doing a gap analysis. So people are indicating on the spreadsheet how they're assessing the competencies that show up in that class. Um, and so it's, that's what we're doing. It's all internal using Google everything. <laughs> Great, so I know that um, some folks will wanna dive into that later on. Um, but so you mentioned that you were also working on making things more transparent. And can you talk a little bit about what's public facing? How do you communicate with families? How does that work? Yeah, so um, if you go to our website and go to academics, um, one of the first links there is course offerings. And rather than having a traditional course offerings booklet, we have a course offerings Google site. 
and it's all organized according to um, the competencies. So, um, well, I shouldn't say it's organized according to competencies. It's still organized according to courses, but all of the departmental and school-wide competencies are right there for people to see in a drop-down menu. Um, and so that's one way, it's very much out there what we're teaching um, through our courses in terms of competence. As I said, we had these um, spotlight, so we call our philosophy of education, learn well, live well, lead well. And so we, LW3 is kind of the short, mm -hmm. short version of that. And so we had LW3 spotlight in our monthly newsletters where teachers are writing articles about the ways they're integrating it into their curriculum. Um, we've had coffees, um, it's in the state of the school address. Um, I did a, I've done a couple of presentations just specifically about what is competency-based education and how does that look at Holton that parents can hop on and um, yeah, do right. webinars. You really can't see the course offerings without seeing the LW3. You can't. So that's what prospective families see as well. And that's something we really, in the last five years, want to make sure people know what they're signing up for, that it's not a bait and switch. You get here right. mm -hmm. thinking one thing and now this is really how, how we approach teaching and learning that, you know, that's what our admissions people are showing prospective families. I think that's fantastic. I know that um, one of my colleagues, Peter Gao, always says, you've got to bring your Marcom and admissions people in on conversations. And it sounds like y'all are really doing that. Yes, absolutely. And that's one of those systems analysis views of looking at organizations, right? Like where in the system are you breaking mm -hmm. down or undermining your, your goals? That's great. Um, so then you're thinking about, you know, sometimes we do all these things for and around students, but we don't actually tell them yeah. what's happening. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit about ways teachers are making this more visible to students? Yes. Well, something super exciting is that we started a course three years ago called seminar. We just generally call it seminar. It's LW3 seminar though. And every single grade level next year by next year will have LW3 seminar in their schedule to go to that class once a week or in some grades twice a week. And that is where we're really setting the language for all of our school-wide goals. It's where we're um, bringing students together to work on those SEL skills so that when they go out and experience it in the classrooms, um, they have that experience and some of the vocabulary and knowledge under their belt. Now, I can't say at this point, we've super aligned so that I know as a 10th grade English teacher when they talked about socioeconomic disparity. Um, so we're not quite at that point of connecting the dots, but that is one place where students are very aware of LW3 goals. The other piece is we've actually, as we work on differentiated instruction, we've had some teachers who want to be building in more choice actually show students the competencies and say, pick which one you want to focus on to demonstrate for me that you're growing in this way through this project. That physics project I mentioned, the students could choose from three or four different competencies from our list on the website that they wanted to address in their project. Interesting. Um, so we've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, Allison's asking, was the creation of the role you previously mentioned, Director of Equity and Wellness, an outcome of this work? It absolutely was. So our global ed director, once we really wrapped our arms around what are the community priorities and what is this program going, how are we going to articulate what we do here at Holton Arms? her title was expanded beyond director of global education to director of diversity, well-being and global education. Yes. Well, that's great. Um, so what advice would you give to someone who's listening to this and saying, all right, I wanna take this on. This is something I wanna do at my school. It's not, the college list is not gonna cut it for us right. as the only marker. Not that it's not, you know, I've got two high school seniors, so I will say, <laughs> I get it. Yes, yes, of course. Um, I would say it's just starting from that place of reflection and asking ourselves as a community, as an institution, what are we really saying we value? What is it we really want to do very well and hone in on that? Part of this process is about pairing 
away some things too. I know we originally thought um, technology was going to somehow play a role in what we're trying to develop in kids. And we realized, no, that's just going to be a tool. That's not going to be something that we weave in necessarily. That's going to be an approach or a tool. Um, and when you start from that place, then the not reinventing the wheel, I think is really important to not just start from a blank screen saying, what do we want kids to learn? But there are really smart people who have spent lots of time articulating some really great learning outcomes and to, you can't Holtonize it, but whatever the name of your school is, come up with your own verb. <laughs> You're out of way to so invent a verb, that's one of the steps. Yes, yes. So I'm really interested then, that's, this is deep work with a committed faculty, lots of collaboration. And then every summer you've got new faculty who join. And so how does that process work? Well, that, I mean, that's a collaborative effort and I hope everybody knows I don't do any of this work by myself. This is with tremendous support from Susanna Jones, our head of school. It's from division directors who are really on board. Um, and so we collaborate on what that curriculum is gonna look like for new teachers. We're, we're changing it every year based on what is the page we want everybody to make sure they start the year on. Um, and we've really turned our new faculty training into much more big picture, applying SEL skills, modeling what it's like to put SEL skills into practice through how we do our sessions at the beginning of the year. And then some of the more nuts and bolts information overload that tends to happen in a new faculty orientation, we're sprinkling those throughout the year strategically, timing them for when they need the information versus front loading a whole year of information. Um, so that's part of what I would say we do. I mean, Melissa definitely partners with me in all of those presentations, you know, so that our vision and mission of Holton, they know from day one, this is what drives the work that we do. And I imagine that you're having those conversations throughout the interview process as well. Yes. And that, that was a shift for us a few years ago. One of those systems thinking, you know, exercises where in our system are we maybe not communicating what we value. And we decided, you know, Melissa needs to interview every single person that walks in this door and our questions need to be designed to ask them, how do these priorities, surely they're not going to call it learn well, live well, lead well, but how do the priorities that inform our philosophy live in your current practice? And we need people to be able to speak to that, um, to come on board because part of change is hiring for change as well. Mm -hmm. um, so really interesting. So right, this is just monumental. I'm sure there are folks who are thinking, okay, I've got to make a list. I've got to do these things, but, mm -hmm. but what's next on your plate? What, what are you intrigued by or curious about? Where do you want to go next? Yeah. Well, we, um, in our lower school, we started ePortfolios, um, a few years back and they are organized according to our school-wide goals. So I, I love that we've got this very concrete thing our students are doing where they're entering work and reflections according to what competence they're building, not according to what subject um, that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I'd love to move that into middle school and perhaps using um, mastery transcripts, beautiful uh, digital website uh, portfolio um, system, but I, I do want to move that into the older grades. Um, and then just assessment in general. I think we really um, need to figure out that good balance between authentic assessment where students are being asked to apply competence in a novel situation versus the importance of checking in on knowledge through maybe somewhat traditional methods um, and just maybe broadening our experience with giving different types of assessments. So I would say those are the two things. Just just a small, <laughs> a couple of things, rethinking assessment. And so um, that is fantastic. I am sure that we will want to have you back on again to talk some more about what's going to happen next uh, as you Holtonize things. Well, thank you for that. inviting me. Just having to articulate it all was very fun, actually, because we just... I think plow straight ahead without pausing to reflect on all that's happened. So it was wonderful for me to be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, well, that is music to my ears because reflection is one of those things that I've built into a lot of rubrics and sometimes 
sometimes it's great. And sometimes I get eye rolls, particularly, you know, from <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Yep. Thank you. And if you're watching this um, and you uh, think that you've got something to offer, reach out. I would love to to hear about what you might want to share via these webinars. So thank you again. And thank you everybody for coming.